And it also means for us as the readers that we need also to try to read this with, in a prayerful spirit. We need to read not only the poem but also the commentary as prayer. In as prayerful a spirit as we can. With as much of the recollection that John longed for when he was writing it. As much of that as we can manage. We need to see it as prayer and we will hear it and benefit from it the more prayerfully we can read it. So I think that is the first important indicator that we need to take from this prologue. It is prayer, it has come out of prayer and needs to be read listens to in prayer. The second important indicator I would take out of this prologue is a scriptural basis for this. And a scriptural basis John refers to it here is a, a line from John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 23. Where, and these are the words of John the Cross here. For he declared, that's Jesus, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit would take up their abode in those who love him by making them live the life of God and dwell in the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the scriptural basis, and that's what this entire work is about. This happens. This is how John the Cross tells it to us. There's no reason to marvel at God's granting such sublime and strange gifts to souls he decides to favour. If we consider that he is God, and that he bestows them as God, with infinite love and goodness it does not seem unreasonable. Before this is what he said, this is what the Son of God said. This is what he said he will do, he will do. And he does so as God. So in this entire work, what John is exploring is what God does as God in the depths of the human person. In the soul, in the deepest centre of the person. What God does as God. And therefore we must not be surprised or marvel at it. Because it's what the Son of God, Jesus, said. It's an entering in deeply into the truth of what Jesus said. The truth of what Jesus said, not in theory, but in reality. John takes us in, in as far as is humanly possible to the depths of the reality of this. And we might say, to use the imagery he's used, shines a light on us, gives us some picture of it. So that's the second point or indicator he's giving us here in the prologue. The third point or indicator he's giving us is what actually is he talking about? And in order to explain what he is, give, give, tell us what he's actually speaking about, he refers us back to his other work, the Canticle. Tells us, 
All the other stanzas we've already commented on, that's the spiritual canticle and obviously Anna de Penalosa e Mercada would have been familiar with that. He said, we speak of the highest degree of perfection that, could, that one can reach in this life, transformation in God. Those of you familiar with the canticle will know this from stanza 22 until the end, until stanza 40, all that section is dealing with the highest state of union and perfection a person can reach in this life. And particularly the last five stanzas are looking towards eternal life. Almost on the threshold, we're almost on the threshold of eternal life there. So there isn't a further stage that one can go to in this life. So what's this about here then? He tells us these stanzas treat of a love deeper in quality and more perfect within this very state of transformation. He's not repeating what he has told us in the Catechism. John doesn't repeat himself. Those of you familiar with John the Cross know that he does not repeat himself. He has given us four books and all four, if we put all four together, we get the full picture. There isn't repetition. What he is doing here is taking us more deeply into what he gave us in the Canticle. And why is that? But I'd explain it something like this. When somebody has read the account that John the Cross has given in the spiritual Canticle, one could make the mistake and I think John probably realized this, of thinking, well, the, this is it now. This is some kind of place of arrival, almost like a, a waiting room for eternity. But it's not that at all. What the living flame makes clear Indeed, it's a principle that John gives us over and over again in his writings in various different ways. Is that the very nature of love is that it cannot remain still. Love is never static. Love is never some nice, smooth, even situation. Love of its very nature is always active. It's always growing getting deeper and having its effect, giving out effects. Love is dynamic. And that's why his image here of fire, the flame, is so important. If a fire is burning, there's always movement, activity, it's changing, things are happening, it's giving out sparks, it's causing heat, it's, it's burning up things. It just, you can't, it just doesn't just stay there and stay the same all the time. That's the nature of love. And here we're talking about the deepest, most profound, most complete love possible. And therefore, it must be a raging fire, full of activity. And so these stanzas, in a sense, are going to take us into something of the depths of this. So it's dealing with something, a love deeper in quality and more perfect. 
even though he says, even though it is true that what these and the other stands as spiritual conscious is all the one state of transformation, and one cannot pass beyond this, yet it can grow deeper in quality and become more ardent. So this work is does re does life. And the very title, if we think about the title, it's the flame of love that's living, love that's alive. Or maybe we could say love that's living the fullness of life. Or maybe we could go further and say love that has brought the person to the fullness of life. And it's not human love, but it's the love of God within the person. Just one or two other points I'll make. This, this work is divided up into four stanzas with a commentary on each stanza. <coughs> but it is not a progression. One, two, three, four. It is each of the four, we could say, are taking us in very, each in a very unique way into the depths of the one reality. The way I describe it is something like the sea. And all that's at the bottom of the and we're taken four times down into the bottom of the sea, given four very different looks at what's there. But clearly we're only getting little glimpses of something far, far bigger. And, and this work is something like that. Each of the four is giving us a distinctive look at into this. Tomorrow morning I'll explore what it is we're looking into. Another point I'd make about us And you see this as you read the work. It's speaking about now, the present. But it looks back and it looks forward. But if you look more carefully, there's more than that. There's a timelessness in this work. Time is always something human, of this world. In eternity, there's no time. And as this work of John's here is dealing with what God does, with God's love, God's presence, God's glory, there's a, there is a certain definite sense of the timelessness of God here. There's something timeless about it. There's a bring together of all time. What is past, present and future in the human mind, in this work is the one. So be aware of that. Goes back, goes forward. It looks back over the spiritual journey. It looks forward. It's the one flame that is doing it all. So through the clever use of time here is indicating the timelessness. The last point I'll make, 
as this sort of general introduction this evening. John is the artist. We never understand John de Cross unless we, we understand that he's got the mind of an artist. He's got the vision of an artist. And so, what he is doing here is not so much explaining something as giving us pictures, images. But in order to enter into them, we have got to somehow do more than be observers. If you look at the vocabulary in this work, seeing and hearing are not that important. The important senses are feeling, touching, tasting, Not so much about understanding as experiencing. We've got to experience what's here. Rather than try to rationally work it out. While John does a lot of explaining in this, and a lot of very practical advice is given in this work, this is not some kind of thing away up in this air somewhere. It's a very practical book. Many respects very down to earth. But it is always at this other level. It is advice for those who are experiencing this. Not for those who stay outside. It pulls us in pulls us into this. So it's about experiencing. He brings us into an experience. Shows it to us. Gives us pictures, images, sounds, taste, feel of something. It's awakening us, raising our awareness of the profound realities, of the profound presence of God, and what that means or what it implies for us as people. A God who in the words of John's Gospel, has chosen to come and live within us, make his home in us, and everything that that means and implies for us. Okay, so we leave it like that and we'll pick it up tomorrow morning and we'll explore a little further. So we just finish with a prayer. <laughs> Lord, we give you thanks. And we pray that your spirit may come upon us. Give us all a quiet night and a peaceful rest. Glory be to the Father, and, and to the Son, and, Son, and to the Holy Spirit, spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall, shall be. be. Amen. Just to finish with one other practical little thing that I didn't mention at the beginning. And, well, it is